to our Conscious Leader Circle, where we meet once a month to support each other through these epic and changing times so we can be more grounded, energized, and focused, or as I like to say, centered, connected, and conscious. And today I'm really excited to introduce our amazing guest speaker, Daniel Morrow. I actually connected with Daniel, would it be about eight years ago now, Daniel, when I first moved out here? And I found your Awakening Ottawa um, site uh, where you were uh, providing an incredible place, which you still have that, uh, for uh, spiritual seekers, holistic practitioners, people on a path of self-development to meet um, and, uh, and get to know each other in the Ottawa area. And then we've stayed in contact and I've been so impressed with all the incredible work that Daniel does. He's a true Renaissance man, uh, gifted in so many aspects and absolutely love sharing his work. Uh, so Daniel Morrow is a mystic scientist and healer. Daniel has designed and taught a spectrum of exciting workshops on neuroplasticity and brain health, accelerated learning, musical medicine and heart IQ. He is especially passionate about working one-on-one -on -one with individuals through their innate vocal signature. Whether the modality is specialized voice work for self-healing, brain performance practices, or emotional alchemy, Daniel has witnessed the rapid shifts that can arise through deep listening and compassionate presence. He will be exploring five pillars of a high performance brain with us today. So let's all mute uh, while Daniel does his presentation. And welcome, Daniel, to our Conscious Leader Circle. Hi, Lydia. Thank you for that introduction. And hello to everybody. Nice to see you. Thanks for being here, bringing your presence and your energy. And uh, I'm just going to share the screen. We'll get started momentarily. I'm going to share my slides. And hopefully you can see that. We good with the slides? Yeah? Thumbs up? Okay. So five pillars of a high performance brain. Uh, my name is Daniel Morrow. And we shall get started. So I have quite a bit of academic background and uh, I started off with electronic engineering. Then I found a passion with math and physics. And then I got very interested in the human mind and psychology. So I did degrees in, in honor psychology. And then it took me into a field called cognitive science, which is a multidisciplinary field, which is an approach to the mind involving AI, philosophy, linguistics, and of course, neuroscience. And I was doing my PhD studies, and I, I found a, a real passion for how the brain works. And then after I finished my academic uh, training, that's when I really started to do the fun stuff, which is to um, learn how to take all the science uh, and bring it in a way that's digestible so that people can sort of optimize their mind, optimize uh, their heart intelligence uh accelerated learning courses for students and the public at large and also you know some delving into the area i call musical medicine the healing powers of sound and music so i developed a, a number of programs with really consolidating all the science and literature i've been learning so this is going beyond like what are the mechanics of the brain we're looking at like well how do i optimize my brain just like you would optimize your car by giving it the good fluids and oils and so forth, right? Because it's an engine, but it won't work as well if we don't fine tune it and give it the stuff it needs. So the human brain is one of the most complex self-contained systems in the known universe. I believe that there are people that say that and, you know, roughly a hundred billion neurons, but it's the complexity and the interconnections of the neurons and the different types and the biochemistry is what makes the brain so phenomenal, just at a physical level. We won't be getting into energetic stuff here today, but we're just looking at the physicality of the brain. So I wrote a book a few years ago, it's on Amazon, it's called Build Yourself a Better Brain. This is the idea that you can sculpt your own brain with these different, what I call brain healthy habits, 
which we'll be getting into. And then I came up with a magazine, which was another way for people to get the info. Uh, it's no longer available, but it was on iTunes. It's called High Performance Brain Magazine. I may be bringing it back at some point, but it was it was a lot of work, but a labor of love. So just I'm just showing you this, not so much to promote the magazine, is to give you a feel and kind of pique your interest around this area. So these are just the covers of the magazine that I created and they, you know, highlight different pieces and articles with the vast spectrum of what we call uh, brain health and enhancing your brain performance. So this lady on the second cover is, uh, you know, an expert neuroscientist from the United States in Texas. She has a laboratory and she did a lot of stuff about how to optimize your frontal lobe. So I had a piece from her. There's another piece on detoxing your brain. And then um, you look, let's let's uh, move forward to the next one. This lady on the left is remarkable. Her name is Barbara Aerosmith Young. I had the, uh, the pleasure to interview her. And you would have no idea that when she was born, she came in with severe brain damage in several different areas. She could not learn properly. She could not understand language. She could not navigate her environment. She kept bumping into things. She could not even cross the street safely or understand where she was in someone's home. She had five or six areas of her brain were severely compromised, but she was a genius at a deep level. She was a genius and she figured out how to redesign her own brain in the eighties and nineties, back when neuroplasticity was not fully accepted yet by neuroscientists. They were just doing the research, but they didn't fully understand how adaptable the brain was, but she figured out how to do some cool things from some animal research and from also uh, an injured soldier, a uh, Russian injured soldier who had seemed to have the same problem as she did. He had been shot in the brain and it, it, it appears that they had the same sort of damage. So she figured out, oh, there's an area of the brain that's causing his issues. There must be something I can do to fix my own brain. And she literally figured out what neuroscientists only figured out many years later, how to rewire your brain by exercising certain functions. So I'm spending a lot of time on that because I want to give you the idea that how if she was able to do what she was able to do, which was she's got her language, she's got all her faculties fully intact. She actually runs a school for um, learning disabled kids with 20 different types of programs for 20 different or more deficits. So again, you have no idea that this person listening to our interview, she just communicates eloquently. And that's just to make the point, like, if that's possible for her, what's possible for the rest of us? So that's why I'm spending a bit of time on that. And so with the magazine, I covered, you know, all the various topics you see on the covers, heart brain interface. That was a, an article I wrote, just taking a piece out of one of the chapters of my book. In the, the far right magazine, you can see why the adolescent brain destroys its own neurons. So there's very interesting research on all facets of the age spectrum. The guy on the left, you may be familiar with, Daniel Amen. He uh, was featured on my magazine. So I had an article from him in there. And he's one of the pioneers for doing a particular type of scanning. The psychiatrists never look in the brain. They just make assumptions, but they don't actually look into people's brains to see what's actually the case. They're just, they're just speculating and guessing, hey, take this drug take this um, so-and-so antidepressant, but he actually looks at the brains with a particular type of scanning technique that he you know, popularized and mastered. So Daniel Amen's amazing. Uh, your brain on love, you know, the you know, kind of biochemistry that's uh, instilled when we're in uh, certain types of relationships, you know, about things like oxytocin. And, and then you see here yoga. Yoga is very good for your brain. The science shows that. We, you know, yogis have known that for thousands of years, but now the science is catching up to what uh, ancient mystics understood a long time ago. And then in that middle uh, magazine cover, Mobile Addiction. So I interviewed this researcher out in California, and he's talking about how addictive the phone is and how difficult how challenging that is especially for younger generations that are born into the technology that that literally people sleep with their phone under their pillows they have their phone on 24 7 it's very addictive people have this kind of phenomena where, where if their phone is not on them they start to get really nervous and anxious um so the technology is great but of course it's finding the balance and then on that right i just highlighted um 
some pieces around music and 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 language. Uh, one of my areas of expertise is musical medicine and the healing powers of music. And then the microbiome, of course, we're going to touch on that very briefly, because that's like another one of the brains, right? It's not just the brain in our head, we've got the gut microbiome. And um, that's, that involves one of the pillars I'll be addressing. And finally, this was the last issue I came up with, and a very fascinating study they did on the hippocampus of London cabbies. Not sure if you're familiar with this, but they did a study on these, these cabbies. Why? Because they have to memorize literally the whole map of London, which is massive. They have to memorize it, and they, they don't need a GPS. They can literally find any place efficiently because they've memorized all the streets. Like That's a massive memory feat, if you can imagine that. Just try doing that in your local city like Ottawa, for instance, or some other city, whatever it is, Vancouver. Um, this is a massive place, and they were able to memorize huge amounts of information. They have to study it. It takes a couple of years. And so they looked at the hippocampus, and sure enough, there's an area of the hippocampus that's enriched. There's a dendritic enrichment. And the hippocampus is important because it has to do with consolidating spatial memories along with other things. So even though I haven't started the presentation yet, I'm throwing in a little, a couple little, you know, clues and tips, right? Just based on this magazine. So this was a labor of love. I did every aspect of this, including designing the covers that you see and interviewing some super cool people of which the most fascinating to me was Barbara Smith Young, because she literally fixed, repaired, and redesigned her own brain from her own genius before it was an accepted thing, neuroplasticity. So with that said, an overview, I usually have a slide here, but because uh, we're constrained with time, I'm just going to say, I'm just going to go into the pillars. I'm actually doing a sixth one, although I said five, I'm throwing in a bonus pillar. And I want to say to you, when I say five pillars of a high-performance brain, this is sort of an arbitrary structuring. It's not like some scientist said, oh, there are exactly five pillars. There's as many pillars as, you, as make sense to use. I'm someone who creates cognitive models. So I structure things in a way, a structure information in a way that's easy for people to absorb that's why i did this because we've got the ha habits the hacks the the uh the practices we can do which there are hundreds so the pillars are like the high level structure targeting certain aspects of our nervous system within which there are different a whole slew of what i call brain health habits okay so when i say five pillars it's not like there are five or there are seven those are arbitrary distinctions but sometimes i'll teach eight OK, for the purposes of this presentation, we're going to cover six. So it's just it's just the most logical way to sort of structure things at a high level so you can understand how to target, say, more your heart intelligence, your gut, you know, the biochemistry in your brain. That's the purpose of why I'm doing that. So it's all about sculpting your brain sampler, as I said in my book, build yourself a better brain, just like we would want to optimize our car engines. The brain is is infinitely more uh, complex. So we should spend a lot more time and effort on that and not take it for granted. So some of the obvious benefits of tuning our brains, the brains in our hearts, the brains in our heads and so forth is, well, pretty much everything, emotional balance, energy, creativity, focus, mental clarity, heart-centered uh, energies and emotions, feeling grounded, concentrating, courage really is in there too. And so let's go to the key concept here, which is neuroplasticity. What is that? I'm sure you've heard of that by now. It's not a new thing. It's been around for several decades. It's become popularized post 2000s. So this neuroplasticity revolution didn't just happen a year ago. It has been a couple decades now and it keeps advancing. And so there's a lot of advances in brain science. It's really about how we're getting a deeper understanding about how the brain exactly learns, how it adapts, how neural pathways are rewired, how you can actually completely reroute cognitive functions, such if someone uh, goes blind later in life, the functions that were attributed to vision now get rerouted. So the, um, the sensitivity on the fingertips suddenly becomes the new vision because now they're reading Braille. So now cognitive functions, even later in life, can be completely rerouted. That's how intelligent the brain is. That's how sophisticated the system is. So that's different than just you rewiring your neural pathways. There's different levels of what we call um, the rewiring. The, neuro the neuroplasticity is the basic sort of overall concept. 
that says, hey, your brain is super adaptable. That's how you learn. That's how you change. That's how you're wired. That's how you have new skill sets, but how you can even reroute cognitive functions. So often we take this, uh, this thing for granted because like, imagine if you really thought to yourself, we have the most complex self-contained system in our brain, 100 billion or it's in, it's like within the universe, it's we each have one in our head and they're each different, they're unique and yet there's some general principles. So if we were to kind of be very present that we go, wow, I got to really take care of that and make sure it's working to its fullest. Because as we saw with Bar Barbara, the sky's the limit what you can do with your brain, even when it gets severe, uh, severely damaged through acquired damage, a brain trauma, or just someone comes in uh, at birth with, with some issues, right? That gives us, that gives me hope and optimism. That's why I focus a lot about that. So we have the power to sculpt a brain. Think of Michelangelo sculpting and taking away the bits and the pieces. And, you know, you have this beautiful sculpture underneath. So you can sculpt your brain and make it better and tweak and, and fine tune certain aspects of it. Because there's the neurological structures, there's the neurons, there's certain functional aspects, and there's very dynamic processes. We know we have the brain waves, um, you know, the, the typical brain waves that we're all familiar with, alpha, beta, and theta, and so forth. And it's all coming down to practices and habits. So one final piece here. So my model is really about high performance brain. It's my book, it's my uh, magazine, but it comes down to trying to consolidate the latest science in the best possible way, in the most easiest to digest way by having the larger framework, which is the pillars, and then saying, okay, within each of these pillars, what are the brain health habits? What are the things we can do to target that pillar if I'm weak in a certain aspect? Say for instance, working on your autonomic nervous system, there's issues with the heart or the gut. So the importance of brain healthy habits, that's like more the implementation of the pillars that we're gonna be uh, giving you six examples of. And you may be familiar with this dude, Joe Dispenza, Dr. Joe as they call him. He's got some cool books out. Um, this is one of them, Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. So what he's basically saying there is, it's difficult to change even when you want to, even when you know what to do, right? So he writes a whole book about that. So that kind of feeds in to this concept around what I call brain health habits or brain healthy habits. What is that? Essentially, that's any habit or practice that can optimally impact your brain's health, which includes the structural uh, that's down to the neuron level or the larger structures in the brain, like language and vision and so forth, the wiring, the neural pathways, the connectivity and the biochemistry. So notice these habits impact various aspects of, of the dynamic and physical structures of the brain. So bad habits can be hard to break because we have a habit and it's difficult to let go of. And by the same token, it can be difficult to create good habits, right? And um, someone named Eben Pagan, I'm boring this term called habit gravity because he does a whole productivity course uh, on how to help entrepreneurs become more effective. And he, he, he talks about habit gravity and he likens it to a rocket trying to take off. And you need the maximum amount of fuel just for those first 100 feet to get the thing going. Then when it kind of escapes the Earth's gravity, it can continue going. It's got some momentum. But at first, it's very difficult. So he's saying it's the same way with entrepreneurs or anybody who's trying to optimize their life in terms of their productivity whether it's in you know your life or your your business life, this habit gravity is it's difficult to overcome at first. So creating the new habit, you need whatever it is, the first 20 days or 30 days to establish that. And then you start to rewire different aspects of yourself, including, but not limited to, your brain. So without further ado, the six brain health habit uh, pillars, and we're going to be going, of course, at a very high level because this is not you know, a full day workshop. This is like uh, kind of like a 30, 40 minute session in total. So the first pillar, and by the way, you're going to hear these pillars. They're not going to surprise you. You're not going to say, oh my God, I have not thought of that before. I have not heard that. You may be feel familiar with all of these things. It's just to, to just for us to focus a little bit more and to say, hey, what can I actually do in my life in terms of these, these habit patterns? So there's some very cool things uh, around sleep. So this is obviously an important pillar. We're, we're about not 
getting just more sleep, although you need a sufficient amount of sleep, it's about um, the quality of your sleep that's ever more important, right? Because you can have a high quality six hour sleep and a poor quality nine hour sleep. So which is better? It's probably the six hour high quality sleep. And there's some people that just can get away with five or six hours. Other people need eight. So th there's variations that are individual, but they say like, if you don't have enough sleep, not good. But if you're getting very poor quality sleep or you're being interrupted, that's the issue because you're at night, there's some very important things going on. So we have here a graph of the sleep cycles. We have more deep wave sleep in the beginning of the night and less REM, rapid eye movement. And then as the, the night progresses, you have uh, increasingly more REM and less deep wave sleep. So the 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 slowest levels, the deepest uh, uh, waves when that we're cycling through at night, we can call them waves or rhythms, is when some deep healing is going on. And it involves some systems in the brain. One of the, the cool things they've discovered uh, a few years back, the G lymphatic system, so sort of analogous to the lymphatic system in our body, but but geared towards the brain. So there's cleaning up that happens at night. And uh, it involves cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, there's hippocampal consolidation that's going on at night. That's why if you don't sleep well, it's hard to remember what you were learning that day and days before. So it's very important to have a good sleep because your hippocampus continues to process what you learned during the day. Very important for students. Cramming and, and not sleeping the night before an exam, worst possible thing you could do. So I always knew when I was studying, I always said, I got to get at least a few hours of sleep because it'll be worse if I don't sleep at all and I try and cram more information. My brain's just not going to be uh, very optimized, quite the opposite. So there's a whole bunch of hacks involving optimizing your sleep. But just knowing that that's one aspect or one function of sleep, just we're just talking on a material level here, not on a spiritual level, because sleep has many important facets to it. But many geniuses, you may have heard this, took naps. You have people like Einstein and Churchill and a whole slew of inventors that they just somehow knew they needed to take their naps during the day and it helped them to be more efficient, more creative. And in fact, Einstein realized that he needed more sleep when he was doing more mental work because your brain uses at least 20% of the energy of your body. So if you're working hard, if you're doing something like an Einstein or another inventor uh, or an Elon Musk or whoever, and uh, you're using up more energy because you're doing all this heavy duty creative mental work. So you need to have proper sleep and you can also boost that with short naps. And so there's a learning consolidation that happens at night via the hippocampus. There's the feel good hormones. Like have you ever uh, missed a whole night of sleep and then you're kind of feeling almost woozy and drunk and foggy the next day ever happened to you? You lose a night and you're like, you're, you kind of have a feeling like being drunk. You can't, you can't communicate clearly. And also your mood's not right. Well, that's the hormones uh, have been sort of altered, right? We have the melatonin, serotonin, precursor to melatonin and so forth. There's many different ways in which you can enhance that naturally. Um, and, and, you know, blue light, reducing blue light before bed, having your air, your room very dark, uh, doing sun gazing, getting sunlight in the morning. There's different ways to reset your system and boost your melatonin naturally. So that's just, you know, one aspect of optimizing the sleep. But we would call this like brain healthy habits geared to the sleep pillar and so you're feeling and looking like this when you're in bed having a nice deep sleep you go to sleep and you sleep through and, and uh, hopefully awake refreshed and rejuvenated and ready to go and you've got a clear mind and, and you're in a good mood so pillar number two uh, just by a show of hands and i can't see everybody's uh pictures but by a show of hands who does yoga here you can just put your hand up I'll just, I'll see if I can cycle through. Okay, yeah, I can see the rest of you, great. Okay, good. Because, okay, perfect. So yeah, yoga is obviously, you know, meditation and yoga has become very trendy in the West the last few decades. It's like, it's everywhere now. It's in corporations and government facilities. It's just a thing, right? And so um, you feel good when you do yoga. And why is that? Now, well, it's because there's some physiological things that are going on, and they have done some studies comparing yoga to other types of exercise. And one of the big things is uh, GABA, you're boosting GABA, which is the uh, 
major inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. Now, if you don't have enough GABA, what happens is you have too much of an excited brain, too many excitatory transmitters, like too much activity going in your brain, you can't sit still mentally. That makes sense, right? So you think of Robin Williams, he was like off the charts with energy, uh, but then it's like so much energy that how do you calm it down when you need to, right? So if people don't have enough GABA, they just are restless and stressed out. Serotonin makes you feel good. GABA sort of calms the whole system down. Dopamine is a reward, a pleasure chemical that uh, boosts you cognitively. It has to do with movement. It has to do with euphoria. It has to do with sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's the dopamine, right? And we get a lot of dopamine just hitting the like, getting likes on Facebook. That's how they know how to manipulate. The system can kind of um, gear, gear the technology towards getting more dopamine hits in our brain, right? So GABA here, we're just focusing on GABA and serotonin because the yoga studies have shown that. The autonomic nervous system becomes more balanced when you do yoga. Also on an energetic level, we can talk about the chakras. That's a little bit harder to test, but I'm talking more about the biochemistry for the purposes of this slide. Your immune, uh, there's certain uh, immune chemicals that are boosted with restorative postures, cytokines and so forth. And of course, there's lots of types of yoga to choose from. One of the other um, features of this, it has to do with cortisol. So you're lowering cortisol while boosting GABA and serotonin, right? So what kind of yoga do I do? There's no fast and hard rule here, but I would suggest pick what makes you calm. Some yogas are actually called restorative yoga. There's beginner yoga, there's restorative yoga, there's healing, there's different names, which gives a clue that that might relax you more. So there's more like Ashtanga yoga and power yoga. You know, they haven't tested the full range of every type of yoga, right? So you just use your intuition and pick the one that you know calms you down the most or relaxes you or centers you. There's literally a whole field of therapeutic yoga using yoga as a therapy. And we know why, at least on a brain level and an autonomic nervous system level, there's a lot of cool things going on. Okay, so just take a pause here. So we're at the we're at the third pillar. We're almost like sort of halfway through the pillars. So we talked about the brain and the head. And we're going to just shift in this direction for a little while because there's a whole new paradigm, whole other revolution with the gut microbiome. Um, you know, the last decade or decade and a half, maybe going back three, four decades, there were some pioneers that suggested, hey, your gut is actually important. It's communicating with your brain. And it was actually a Canadian researcher who was one of the first discoverers of this, the importance of the gut microbiome. And they thought he was absolutely crazy. Um, his name escapes me right now, but he was a pioneer in this area. Then later they caught up and said, oh, wow, yeah, there's some important things going on between the gut uh, microbiome and the brain. There's like a bi-directional pathway. So the gut microbiome, it, the integrity of it, the balance of it, um, and the overall balance of the microbiota is linked with your brain health, with neurological performance, with longevity, uh, with your immune system, with so much more. And so there's uh, there are distinct uh, pathways in which these two brains are communicating with one another. You've got the autonomic nervous system, you've got the immune system, the cytokines, you've got the HPA axis, which is hypothalamus, pituitary, pituitary, adrenal. And so this is governing uh, adaptive responses to stress, which then Im impacts memory and emotions. So there's a lot of crosstalk here with these systems. And then you also have the vagal nerve, which is running through uh, the system, including the heart. So all these systems are connected. And there's some people out there that understand this very well. And they study the interactions between of the brain, the immune system, and the gut. You can't sort of just like isolate one and and think that it's operating on its own because they're all always uh, uh, interacting in various ways. So we want to talk about bacterial balance. There's different types of uh, good bacteria that are needed. In fact, there's 10 to the 14 of uh, bacterial systems and they, this is like something like 150 times more than our genome, our human genome, and 10 times as many cells in our body. That's how many uh, bacteria are there. 
and and in the microbiome and so it's that's how important it is it's a it's a form of intelligence that links with the rest of the body uh including the brain but not limited to and so we want to be putting in the right foods and avoiding toxic or processed foods this is kind of obvious but then probiotics have become big because well how do we boost uh how do we boost the good bacteria for somehow we're not getting it in our foods right we don't have quite uh enough of the balance and so you can of course purchase um different types of probiotics with anywhere from a couple to you know 20 something different type of uh a species of bacteria so we got the lactobacillus family the bifidus and the strepto family and they all have there's hundreds right so there's a lot of different variety here but it's a matter of getting that uh balance to your microbiota and then there's a the prebiotic foods, which is different. Those aren't the bacteria themselves. Those are foods that are not digestible. They're the fibers that then produce good bacteria. So we can talk about things like garlic, uh, dandelion greens, chicory roots, whole oats, apples, bananas. So consider prebiotic foods, which then replenish positive bacteria, even though, so they are not themselves the bacteria. The probiotics are the bacteria which you supplement. And you want to be very picky about the probiotics you get because, you know, there are different combinations, different levels of quality and so forth. And um, you, you just want to be careful about that. There's certain additives and things that I, I kind of look for when I'm purchasing uh, such products. So that's one aspect. We're talking about the microbiome. And then of course, there's your diet itself. There's the superfoods, right? So this is like another piece. We're just talking about there's the microbiota, there's this, this complex uh, microbial uh, infrastructure, but then there's, well, what, what are the foods, right? So if we, you may have noticed that when you're hungry, you haven't eaten in a while, you're kind of, again, foggy, moody, all those kind of typical things we experience, and you eat that just the right food, um, that you feel good immediately, sometimes within half an hour, and suddenly, you know, I'm feeling better, my brain, I'm kind of sharp, or it can, it can be that fast, right? So it's nourishing the neurons, it's nourishing the system. So there's, there's the biochemistry, and then there's literally, you know, your brain's needing what it needs to do its job. So there's many different dietary styles. I'm not here to pro promote one over the other, although I've played with a lot of these, raw, vegan, paleo, and so forth. I like to, to, I like to endorse what I call flexitarian, which is for me is like, Whatever I feel is right for me intuitively, uh, that's my diet, right? It can be a combination of raw food, vegetarian, some meat, what, you know, whatever I need for my body, my physiology for the time of year. So that's what I'm calling flexitarian. I heard that term before and I liked it and I think it applies. So we don't want to get too rigid on I must, you know, have this diet all the time. I must always be raw. I must always, some people feel they need meat. Other people feel, no, I want to be vegetarian only or I want to be vegan right so that's that's a personal choice and uh, it takes like kind of an inner compass and a discernment to know what's right for you complete proteins these are the ones that have the, the primary nine essential amino acids that the body can't produce things like spirulina hemp quinoa eggs and there's a a lot of a lot of uh, foods that uh, poultry there's lots of foods that are considered complete protein. So those are good because they provide the 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 nine essentials, uh, fatty acids, healthy fats, coconut oil, avocado, walnuts, grass fed, organic, ghee, and then superfoods. This is an area that I'm I'm very passionate about. There's so many types of superfoods, and David Wolf is is one of the go-to people for me who's just uh, really figured out um, this area pretty well, I think. And he also has kind of a spiritual approach to everything he does. And brings in a lot of different principles, blending with the science. But yeah, there's there's so much out there right now. So what I like about superfoods is that you can get like a lot of antibiotic, um, not antibiotics, um, antioxidants. I meant to say, and uh, you can get you know proteins and fats and sort of a lot of things combined in this one food. So you don't have to think about calorie counting or getting the you know the precise breakdown of what you eat because some of these are like walnuts for for instance, that look like the brain hemispheres are good for the brain, right? Cacao, goji, and so forth. Okay, so we got we got a few more pillars left. So 
this is a whole, I mean, this is a huge area. I do a whole workshop on just this one alone because there's a whole institute called uh, the Institute of Heart Math you may have heard of. And they've been doing the science of the, you know, heart IQ, heart intelligence. There's a little brain in your heart, literally. It's not a metaphoric. The ancients knew something about the importance of the heart. Even with Chinese characters, there's a lot of symbols for the heart, connecting the heart and brain. So uh, the ancients understood the importance of the heart. And in India and, and yoga, we think about the inner guru. That has to do with your, your heart. And so it's literally got a mini brain in there that connects with the brain in your head. It's got some of the same biochemistry and electrical system, electrical signals to, to communicate bi-directionally. And so the heart is amazing. Now, this is a well-known graph and a well-known phenomena around heart coherence. If you've heard about heart coherence, put up your hand just so I have a, an idea who's up to speed on this. Uh, keep your hand up. Sorry, I can't see everybody. Okay, uh, that's great. The ones I can see got their hands up. Um, cool, so heart heart breathing. Well, let me see here. Uh, I skipped the slide, sorry. Okay, so let's go back to this one. So what they found is, and they've done a lot of complex studies at HeartMath for like uh, more than three decades now, and actual peer-reviewed research. And what they found is that when a person's in a state of coherence, they have this smooth curve, which you see on the right. So if you're feeling like what are called heart-centered emotions, like appreciation, gratitude, um, just love, compassion, tolerance, things like that, versus um, anger, frustration, you know, stress, agitation, worry, right? Like just let, let's, let's put those things as solar kind of polar opposite emotions. If you're more on the left side, then you actually see this jagged curve, which is representing heart rate variability. Heart rate variability is just the beat-to-beat uh, -beat changes in the speed of your of your heartbeat. Now, we know that if you measure your heartbeat, you'll get an average. You'll get 60, 70, 80 beats per minute. But that's not heart rate variability. The heart rate variability is the up and down cycling of the speed of your pulse, which cycles about every 10 seconds or so. And if you're healthy and coherent in your heart, if you're coherent in your emotions while you have a healthy heart, but more importantly, you're feeling coherent, calm, centered, you'll have that smooth curve, meaning you can see that that on the curve of the right, for example, it goes from 60 to 80 something. So that's a cycle that can be that um, can change uh, in its depth. So that can be anywhere between 30 or more uh, beats per minute change between the cycles, so the up and down. So you want it to look more like a sine wave versus this jagged mountain on the left. So it has to do with how mindful you are, how meditative, how present, how calm were the emotions, right? So there are things we can do. Those would be the practices. What's interesting about the research on the heart, and I dedicate a whole chapter uh, in, in, in my brain health book on that uh, because it's so important. Really, we're just scratching the surface. The heart is considered the most powerful biological resonator in your body. And in fact, what they talk about in these studies from heart math is that Sometimes the heart can veto, the brain and the heart can veto the brain and say, no, 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 we're not doing that. It can take over and say, no, this is the best way to go. So to the extent that you're more heart-centered, your heart can take over the role of things in your body relative to your brain so that you're not in a sort of cognitive rational mode, which can, can go either way, right? So that's the, this is the idea of blending heart and mind, uh, but not just in a conceptual way or an emotional energetic way but physiologically this is happening the brain and the heart's communicating with the brain and the head through similar biochemistry and electrical signals and but beyond that here's a very cool thing about the brain and your heart there's not just two but four distinct pathways in which your brain is communicating uh with your the brain in your heart is communicating with your brain in your head and other uh, organs in the body. So one is electrical, that we said, and then there's the neurotransmitters and the biochemistry. But then there's also the electromagnetic. There's an electromagnetic pathway. This is more subtle. They still have to do research on it. So electromagnetic actually is something that's taking place between the brain and the heart. And then the fourth one is a rhythmic rhythmically coded system there's a rhythmic language of the brain now when i say rhythm i don't mean measuring how fast your heart is 
that's very crude. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about um, more difficult to measure subtleties in the rhythmic variations of the heart pulses that actually um, provide information to the cells in your body. The cells in your body, the cells in your organs understand this rhythmic language of the heart. So guess what? If you're in a state of heart coherence, as measured by heart rate variability and, and psychologically, uh, subjectively, how you feel emotionally, versus being stressed out and agitated and being completely uh, not coherent in the heart, this is obviously going to have a direct impact on the cells in your body and your organ systems. So now there's a science behind this, right? So we can bring in the heart. It's no longer a metaphor, something that ancients said or yogis or mystics. It's like, well, the science is there. It's been, it showed up a few decades ago, right? So there's uh, this is a very oversimplified slide because I'm consolidating like a lot of stuff in just one uh, slide here. But you know, positive emotions, uh, feeling good, going into nature. There's many ways to feel good, right? So your go-to is your pets. For example, I was talking to Lydia earlier about that. Our favorite pets, like cats and horses, um, you know, dolphins, cetaceans, and things like that. But there's our pets, which really impact uh, us emotionally and energetically. There's going out into nature. Um, and there's many, many ways, right? So those would be the brain healthy practices to get yourself in a state of heart coherence. Now, in terms of the science of this and the technology, I've got a, I've got an M wave, a version of the M wave for um, my, it's a phone app, right? It goes in the smartphone. You can actually plug this thing into your phone, connect it to your earlobe. You connect it to your lobe and it measures the heart rate variability. It's very just gentle. It just measures it. And then you can have feedback and you can go, how am I feeling? And what is this telling me? Where is my coherence level at? And you can actually get increasingly more masterful because if you're coherent at the first level, you may not be coherent at the second, third, fourth. So as you get better at this, you start to realize, oh, what can I do to get coherent in real time? And this thing, this device is telling me objectively What's my coherence level? It even shows those curves that I that I illustrated on the page before. You can get those and you can just do it for four or five minutes and it gives you different uh, practices you can do to help with the coherence. So I've played around with that. I've done like vocal toning and humming and just meditating, quite, trying different things to see how that might impact the coherence. And hard breathing, they have like so many different like... Uh, heart-based breathing techniques that they've patented at HeartMath, but it can be as simple as just slowing down, taking a deep breath in, breathing into your heart, feeling into your heart, putting your hand on your heart, and just feeling what are your emotions, and then just sort of magnifying the energies around your heart and realizing, oh, that's communicating with my autonomic nervous system. And as you slow down, you increase your exhales, and that can help activate more of a parasympathetic activity, which is calming. So there's all these various things we can do around our, our envisioning and around our breath and the, and the intricacies of how we can breathe. And so um, I may share a little secret about that towards the end around what would be the optimal number of breath cycles um, for achieving coherence. So I'll get you all maybe to guess at that number unless you know it already, but if, if you don't, I'm curious what you think would be the optimal number of breathing cycles that they've found that can optimize coherence, okay? So we'll just let's kind of tease that for something towards the end. Pillar number five, frontal lobe, the crowning glory of the human brain. We have the largest uh, proportion of frontal lobe compared to any other uh, creature of the animal kingdom. We have... Uh, it's about a third of our brain. And within the frontal lobe, there's the prefrontal cortex, which is considered the executive uh, functioning part of the brain. And so this is obviously very important around productivity. So I just kind of focused on productivity for the purposes uh, of, of this slide and this presentation, because you know I'm an entrepreneur like Lydia and like perhaps some of you here and Productivity is about how best to use your time and to focus and so forth. So there's a lot of entrepreneurs that I follow that focus on how do I be more productive? How do I not waste my time? How do I not get distracted? How do I focus on what's important? Well, that has to do with the frontal lobe. And guess what's being most compromised in the modern day world the last several decades? 
thanks to no small part to technology. It would be our focus and our concentration. And part of that is because of the wonderful gift of technology, you know, search engines, Facebook, all the social media, you know, our, our smartphone is like more, more has more capacity than, you know, the first lunar modules, the first computers, we got more computing power than they had all those decades ago in our little phone. It's like a, it's a powerhouse. So we offload some of our cognitive functions, but the downside of that is that newer generations are not as good with communication and spelling, for example, and remembering the Greeks were very good with memory. We got to practice those things just because we have technology. We don't want to offload too much of our cognitive faculties because then we can become uh, slow in those departments. Like literally we're not exercising the things we used to uh, from a brain point of view. So the natural cycles, this is the BRAC cycle. And it's, it's just a natural activity cycles that happens about every 90 minutes to two hours. So there's a great variation of this, but what happens is if you don't honor this cycle um, and you don't take a break, your brain just like wants to shut down and rest. And if you don't let it shut down and rest, it you're not efficient going forward. Now, uh, Brendan Burchard is someone that, that I've been following for a while, and he's done a lot of high performance studies. And what he's found is that the optimal, uh, the optimal, time frame for getting work done. Now, this is not learning. It's getting work done, which is learning is different. You're uh, uh, inputting information and consulting and so forth. So just getting stuff done, it's somewhere around 51 minutes. Okay. So you can kind of, you can kind of use that as a rough, rough 50 minutes, take a 10 minute break and then continue. And then you'll be within this, this Brack cycle. Um, Cause if you, if you go for like two hours, three hours, you're plowing through your, your brain wants to take a break. You're not honoring the natural cycles. So these cycles are, you can see they're everywhere. They're at night. There's the brain waves. Um, there's the G lymphatic uh, system. There's the cerebral spinal fluid. There's all these like rhythmic cycles uh, within your heart and your brain, your nervous system. That's important to honor them and to feed them what they need. So one thing at a time, like that person I had on my cover who did a, a piece on frontal lobe, this uh, neuroscientist from Texas. You may remember I showed, she's on the cover of one of those. She's like focusing on how to make a very efficient frontal lobe. She studied this in the laboratory. And one very simple practice is just do one thing at a time. It seems like bizarrely ridiculous and simple and obvious. But, and yet in the world we live in, multitasking seems to be, oh, I have to you know do so many things at the same time to be more efficient, which is actually counterproductive. As it turns out, people are checking their email dozens or hundreds of times per hour in the corporate settings, and they're literally they're literally um, going back and forth uh, between tasks, and that's so inefficient. Not only is it inefficient, but it actually is damaging to your brain in the long term. So there's a good kind of multitasking that a mother does when she's taking care of her infant and you know feeding and working and answering the phone. There's a kind of a positive aspect to that motherly multitasking that mothers can do well because it's biologically built in that's not what i'm talking about i'm talking about the incessant going back and forth between you know the browser social media check your phone check your email you know just it just there's this distractibility that's almost been programmed into us right so what's the you know what's the anecdote well you know mindfulness has become this thing the last few decades right the dalai lama and the neuroscience of mindfulness and mindfulness-based stress reduction, which they've scientifically, you know, been studying for, for quite a while now. And so just, you know, becoming mindful, doing one thing at a time. And uh, some of the entrepreneurs that I follow talk about minimizing distractions or actually, um, what's the word? Planning your interruptions. So if you're an entrepreneur, and you know certain people need to be called. You don't allow the people to call you at random times. You schedule your interruptions so that now I'm going to go do this thing when I choose to do this thing and deal with these people that I, I need to speak with, right? So there's this block time ratio of productive tasks, which I just alluded to earlier. And Brendan's the genius on that because he's done the high performance studies with his coaching program, but also actually studying the most productive people in the world, productive entrepreneurs and athletes and who, whatever field they come from. Okay.
So frontal lobe, Buddhism meets neuroscience, I call this. And this is a famous monk. His name escapes me in this moment, but you may have uh, seen or heard about him. He's one of the most mindful. He's got one of the most calm frontal lobes. or He's, he's, he's known for like, he's mastered the most high level of mindfulness by actually measuring his brain, okay? So he's got some accolades in the scientific world because he's just, he's so good at what he does. And so, you know, they strap on these electrodes and they've measured what happens when he goes in these meditative states. And there's some cool things that happen. And now we're not necessarily trying to become a monk, but it what it turns out is you can actually achieve some great, you can accomplish some great things in the arena of mindfulness very quickly in a matter of weeks, not like 20 years, right? And so there's some studies have been done. I think, do I have a slide on that? I guess I don't have a slide on that. So I'll just say it. Um, uh, they've, they've, they've done the mindfulness-based stress reduction and other types of mindfulness studies. And they found that within eight weeks, as little as eight weeks, a person doing like an hour per day, something like that over eight weeks, that person changes the structures in their brain. The amygdala, the hippocampus, the frontal. There's, there's many brain areas that get structurally changed that they can measure this and it only takes about eight weeks and this is for a, a novice person not someone that's uh, masterful in meditation so with the brains of monks just to show the contrast they have superior attention span and focus that's what us as entrepreneurs that's what we're looking for right or anybody that wants to be efficient in whatever they're doing work-wise or in your personal life you want to you know have good attention good presence good focus and so there's a stronger left frontal activity, very calm amygdala. Remember the amygdala is the emotion center, also fear center, right? If it's overly triggered, it gets in the way. Uh, it hampers our brain resources, so to speak, if your amygdala is overly triggered. And by the way, if you get into a negative pattern of being overly triggered, uh, there's a two-way kind of loop happening between the amygdala and the hippocampus, and you can degrade the neurons in the hippocampus from getting caught in this uh, sort of nervous system loop where you're always sort of hyper nervous and anxious because so the amygdala and the hippocampus and there's a there's a crosstalk there and we got to be careful because that's uh, one of the memory centers at least it's not the whole memory center but it's one of the the important consolidation centers high gamma brain wave so gamma is a higher brain wave uh, that's some people associate with being in the zone or um, high levels of consciousness or monk type of consciousness or being in that creative zone, right? Um, peace, compassion, well-being, those are the subjective aspects. So what they do, what they find with these monks, these, these monk um, studies with the neuroscience and the frontal lobe in particular, and some of these other structures is they're very hard to trigger. They're very hard to surprise or freak them out. Like if you throw stimuli at them and do do things that would normally kind of uh, cause a person's brain to react, they can stay very calm in the face of all kinds of weird stimuli being thrown at them. So doesn't that sound like a useful uh, state to be in where no matter what comes at you from the external world or other people, including your own uh, internal dialogue or monologue, to be able to be just calm and centered in the face of you're in the volcano, you're in a storm, and you can maintain that you know, you know, serene um, calmness and centeredness. The mental benefits are many. An obvious one is the stress and anxiety. There's the focus and concentration, of course, because you remember in the frontal lobe, which does many things, including it's or it's or also um, involved with language, production of language, Broca's uh, Broca's area, and so forth. But there's the prefrontal cortex, which is kind of like you can call that the executive center. Um, focus and concentration is all important. It's what's lacking in modern day society, alertness and attention span. Some studies, uh, some people have jokingly said, oh, there's studies that show that we have the attention span of a goldfish. Has anybody ever heard that? <laughs> now it's a little bit exaggerated. It's not quite a proper comparison, but it's like the idea of the goldfish is like a one or two seconds. And in a way, if we're like jumping around from one thing to another, it's almost like sometimes we're acting like a goldfish, like, oh, I, I'm tired of that uh, stimulus. Let me go over here and check my phone. Let me check my social media two seconds later. So it's it's not quite that dramatic, but that's just used to 
is a playful way of kind of uh, making the point. Creativity is very important. We mentioned the gamma brain waves, being in the zone, being creative, the aha moments associated with the higher gamma brain waves. And in, in cognitive science uh, research, which was uh, one of the areas that I studied, they were trying to associate with consciousness uh, with the gamma. So gamma seems to be doing a lot of different things. The, the main, the four main brain waves that everyone has been familiar with for a long time is beta, alpha, and what are the other ones? Theta, delta, right? And then you've got a lot of theta and delta running throughout night and so forth, the deep, the deep slow wave sleep. But gamma is a higher brainwave state. It's much faster, and it seems to be linked to core cognitive abilities, higher functioning abilities, we'll call it. And notice that the, the, the monks have more of that. And finally, physical benefits, as you would, might expect, uh, sleep is enhanced, blood pressure is lowered, you have pain relief, and immune function is increased in the telomeres. What are the tel telomeres? I think you've probably heard of that, right? And so it has to do with uh, uh, the, the tips of the chromosomes, and you have larger telomeres, and this is a very good thing or aging and so forth. So lots of physical, mental, psychological benefits for doing uh, meditation or mindfulness types of practices. The frontal lobe is enhanced, but so are other structures in the brain and also the activation of certain uh, brainwave states like gamma. Oh, there's one more pillar. I forgot, I'm, I'm just on five. There's still six. This is a super fast one and we'll kind of bring this to a close. That biochemistry is obviously important uh, for our emotions, for many of the functions of the body. We have the neuroendocrine system, right? And uh, the endocrine glands, which release different types of chemicals. We have the HPA axis, right? Which is, you know, having to do with monitoring and adapting uh, to stress responses. So the biochemistry here for the purposes of this pillar, what we're, what I'm looking at is uh, brain biochemistry, and I'm looking at, well, what can we do? Well, we know that heart health is directly linked to brain health, right? There's like, it's not like the brain is, is in your head and there's these, all these other systems and let's just do some things that are good for the brain. Whatever you tend to do for your brain is usually good for your body and vice versa. It's not like, you know, isolated systems they are always interworking. So raising your heart rate is essential. Now it's just as simple as doing movement or doing cardiovascular activity, cardio exercises several times a week. Now they find just walking is good for you. Just walking in fresh air, getting prana, getting sunlight, just walking is really good for your brain. But the key here is, and this is the main point of this slide, is that not only that the cardiovascular intensity impacts your neurochemistry, that as you get your heart rate increasingly higher, you get a whole slew of more chemicals. So you get like this biochemical cocktail that shows up in your brain just from increasing your heart rate. So you have at the low end walking, then you have moderate cardio, maybe biking or jogging, then you have very fast, very, you know, really increasing your heart rate. Then you have high intensity interval training, which is like sprint and then stop, sprint and stop. Do very high activity, get your heart rate up and then stop. That's the key. You stop and you rest. And they find that's really good for your brain because you've got all these growth factors that show up. You've got um, human growth factor. That's a very important one. As we age, that goes lower and lower and lower. Well, um, getting your heart rate up quite high can like boost your HGH. And then that has all kinds of impacts on your longevity. But there are other growth factors here that I'm not mentioning that have to do with learning and memory and neuronal health. So let's just focus on one thing here, which is BDNF. Anybody know what that stands for? So brain-derived neurotropic factor, brain-derived neurotropic factor. This, they call this miracle grow for your brain, miracle grow. You know, you put something right, fertilize or something in your plants, they will grow faster. It's like that for the brain. And it's just one of the, the, uh, the chemicals that can be boosted when you do the right type of exercise. So that's the amazing thing that just going out and moving and getting your heart rate up to a sufficient pace that's safe for you like if someone's got if they're they've have heart issues or they're heart attack prone you don't want to go out there and do high intensity interval training obviously you're going to do something that uh, makes sense for you but in general the idea here is the faster you make your heart go when you're doing your cardio the more of a biochemistry 
that shows up in your brain that's good for you on many levels, not just uh, with your brain, but the rest of your system. And so we always hear about the runner's high. So there's endorphins. So we know about endorphins that make you feel good, but we're talking about a lot of other chemicals here. We're talking about HGH, BDNF, and a bunch of other ones that help to basically grow new neurons, uh, impact the dendritic growth, and clean up, very importantly, helping to clean up um, around these areas with the, their whole neuronal infrastructure. So BDNF, very important. And... You know, there's many, you can do anything you like that's getting your heart rate up. It can be cycling, jogging, swimming is great because it uses most of your body, right? Um, so whatever it is that makes you happy and you know you're getting your heart rate up, you can just kind of gradually bring it higher and higher and higher and see if you notice the subjective changes because know that on a biochemical level, there is something going on. Um, so CrossFit training is one thing you may have heard of. CrossFit training too, which is, you know, you have these, very short but high intensity exercises that can be weight training they can get they can be whatever it is like a conglomeration of different things that you put together in a 20 minute routine and you get a lot done in that 20 minutes because your heart rate's going high you're taking the appropriate breaks and you're benefiting uh, in terms of your sleep and your mood and your brain function your focus and all those other things we talked about so that's basically the end of the presentation in terms of the pillars. How do we nourish our brain temple? I've gave I've given some examples in this session. Um, I've done various things. I showed you that I have a book online. Um, but for those that rather do more uh, dynamic forms of learning, which I myself am a fan of, I no longer have the magazine online, unfortunately. I just show you that to kind of uh, pique your interest about certain of these topics. I've got online courses. I've done live workshops on the pillars of a high performance brain, which is much more integrative and immersive. And what I'm going to be launching soon is a membership site. Haven't done it yet, but I thought I'd introduce it to you. It's like a monthly membership and we do very focused training on a particular topic. It could be turmeric. It could be something about the microbiome. It could be something about heart IQ. We go very focused and you get something that you can take away and do. And then the second time a month, I would be doing an autonomic nervous system reset, which I'm about to talk about because um, I'm going to be including a little gift here uh, for everybody if you want to take me up on that. So there's the online courses that I mentioned. This is just to give you an idea. Like I call them pillars, but here I call them dimensions. Focus, sleep, dimension number two. Three is microbiome. Four is activating heart coherence. Five, well, I didn't talk about it at all today, which is a whole other complex and fascinating domain, tuning your musical brain. Okay, there's a whole other dimension of, of working with the brain that I didn't get to talk about today. The biochemistry I just mentioned with the cardio, and then there's your brain on creativity. So there's different ways to combine these different um, um, aspects of the brain optimizing information to more to relax, to focus more on creativity, to synchronize things. So I kind of bundle these little courses into various ways, depending on what you want to focus on. Um, so the, the brain series, I'm just about to launch that in April. So anybody that wants to be part of that, there's a low monthly cost. Um, there's no commitment. You can just kind of try it and get out if you don't like it. But if you like it, then it's a live training and it kind of gets you to commit to something, learn a little piece. And it's very... Um, you know, it's like an uplifting kind of thing. I'm trying to bring the research in a way that is easy to digest and it's an easy thing you can do. It's a simple practice and you don't get overwhelmed because that's the problem. We don't want to overwhelm people that are already overstimulated in our society, right? We want to like help you to feel calm and here's a cool tip or a practice or a hack that's based on science. Other thing I've been doing the last few years is different types of coaching. As Lydia mentioned, uh, with the bio, I do voice work. I do empathic coaching, but I also do the more of the scientific stuff with the brain health consultations. And I blend these all together based on the need of the person that um, is in front of me. And so that is connected with what I'm offering as the bonus gift today. So this is not me handing you a PDF or something that I can just go, here you go, go read it. I'm giving you my time, each and every one of you that take me up on this offer, a 20 minute alpha induction nervous system reset. Now I charge $180 for my brain health consultations. So I'm, I'm, I can set aside 20 minutes for you. And this is quite helpful because I started doing this about two years ago. There was a lot of stress around the pandemic. 
So I started just doing this call in the chaos group on Facebook and I would do live streams based on donation and people seemed to like it. I would basically help people to get into an alpha state, which is very creative, calming, healing, and then program the heart IQ in there, balance the autonomic nervous system, and just a whole lot of positive envisioning combined with breath. And I kind of sneak in a little bit of science so the person is learning while they're kind of in this state, which is conducive to healing and focus and productivity and so forth. So that's the idea here. I can customize these alpha sessions, which I was, I was doing on live streams for a group. I can customize it to you, to whatever you need. We can jump on a Zoom. I've got some nice calming uh, alpha brainwave music in the background. And you tell me what it is that you need. And I customize like uh, one of these sessions on the spot. So if, if you want to do that, go for it. Just send me an email and we'll set up like a version of a coaching session. And then you get a Zoom link just like you did for today. And so, yeah, that's that's my offer for our session today. And I know we, better, we went a bit over, but um, I'm just going to stop there, Lydia. And uh, if anybody has questions, I'm here. Well, thank you so much, Daniel. That was beyond impressive. And I'm sure we could have you back on, you have so many workshops and um, offerings that was so comprehensive and very relevant, right? I think we can all relate to everything that you were uh, discussing. Um, and I'm just trying to, can you guys see me talking? I'll do a stop share. I'll stop sharing the screen now, I guess. Should I? Yeah. Let me okay. See. There we go. Okay, there. I don't <laughs> me and my Zoom I'm trying to figure things out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, but thank you so much. That was that was truly phenomenal. Um, and I know we're 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 over time, but I I'm I'm grateful that you're able to share as much as you did. And anybody that wants to stay on, um, now's your time to chat one on one with with the master. Uh, Daniel and um, and please do take him up on that incredible uh, complimentary offer. Uh, he's really amazing to work with, as you can tell. So, any questions? I do. Joanne, um, I've been on an interesting journey. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Um, because of chronic depression, all my life, most of my life. Um, I've been seeking help and it's been very interesting. It's very difficult to get help. <laughs> but, um, it's, uh, have you heard of, of course you have, RTMS? I'm um, super well versed in it, but is re it? Re repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation where they I'm aware of it but i don't i don't use yeah. it. Have, you, have you yourself delved into it um i was just offered um i just accepted going on a wait list to um receive this magnetic therapy for depression mm -hmm. and i was wondering if you'd heard much about that um i've heard good things about it but i i'm not going to present myself as yeah. an expert on that so i'd rather not mislead you i have heard that this can be very effective Mm -hmm. I don't know with respect to depression what I can do, but it's 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 a very um it's it's very it, you're actually really doing some very key things in the brain with this mm -hmm. with this methodology. And so, you know, I desensitization, all these different types of right. uh, systems that people use, and some work for some people and some not for others. So um if it's been recommended to you, I would say go for it, but I can't from my personal uh -huh uh experience say yes or no on that yeah. have you tried other things i'm just curious Are you i've tried all friends? i've tried many 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 antidepressants that i'm actually okay. going i'm doing a genetic assay test to to determine what drugs actually work for me best in combination okay. so right now i'm in an experimental zone <laughs> which has been yeah. and it hasn't been easy to be yeah, honest. you're like you're like in your own experiment. You're trying all these things, and I know that's that's what people are doing. Like your your own experiment. What works for me? What do I need? Are you have you been um, placed on conventional pharmaceuticals? I'm just wondering, like antidepressant type. Oh, many different ones. Many, do you, many. Do you? Um, what's your approach to 
um, pharmaceuticals versus natural supplements? Do you, has anybody, do you blend those or is it more, what direction are you going? I'm trying to get a feel for. I'd like to go in a different direction. I've really only used prescription drugs. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just because, you know, we know there are uh, side effects to those kind of things. And that what I alluded That's to, right. just, just the walking, right? And what they found is when people walk, it's it's the equivalent of taking antidepressant drugs. They've actually done studies and they go, you take a walk because you're getting, you're getting fresh air and energy and sunlight. You're getting like multiple things, not just the exercise. So uh, I'm not saying to someone, don't do pharmaceuticals, but I know like my own approach mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is I'm, I'm going more for natural, um, natural solutions if I can, because, um, what we know about some of these pharmaceuticals is what they're doing is they're targeting receptor systems in your brain. Right. And then what you probably know this, I'm sure everybody yeah, I, knows, they we become addicted to them. We, we then need them. So for instance, um, you take a melatonin supplement and it makes you sleep better, but then your brain starts to go, Oh, I don't need to produce that myself anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then suddenly you don't have as much of that as you need. And, and I have some very specific experiences with friends and colleagues who have had issues with a class of drugs called benzodiazepines. So that those are highly addictive and one must only use them for a short mm -hmm. period of time because then your brain, what happens is it's helping you to give you more GABA. Then literally the, the receptors go away and it's harder to produce GABA because you're just feeding, you're just flooding the brain uh, mm -hmm. artificially. So that's my concern around um, some of those class of um, sedatives and antidepressants. But if you can find natural approaches, but the transcranial, yeah. the transcranial is something that I, I would endorse, but I don't have enough expertise in it to say, to give you much insight, but I have heard many good things about it. So it's worth trying, as you yeah. say, you're running an experiment and just see what happens and you'll get probably the feedback pretty quickly. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I have a friend, a friend, I used to babysit him when he was born, but he is an alcoholic and he's done the brain surgery where they put the chip into the area of addiction. Oh. Yep. So he can, can actually control his addiction. And, um, and that, I mean, the research, the brain research is just beyond my comprehension right now. So yeah. I've, I find your presentation uh, brilliant, actually, and okay. right up my alley right now. <laughs> yeah, the so, sky's the limit with this. Like, it's, yeah. such, it's such an overview level that I was talking about. You, you know, you can go very deep. And by the way, in terms of the... Uh, what you just mentioned, there's a mind body interfaces. They've done some very cool things. Like, I think we have to be careful in this area, but with like being able to control things with your mind, they've, they're, you know, yeah. they've gone in some direction with that. So they, they understand more and more. We just have to be morally uh, responsible. I'm talking about the people yes. who are doing the AI technology and the, the brain implants and stuff like that. Cause it can be helpful for some, someone who needs the prosthetics. Cause we have hearing aids. We don't think of that as negative. We have a hearing yeah. aid. But it's just like, okay, what's the what's the balance we're using this technology uh, to infer interface for people that are genuinely benefiting by it? So thank you for your comments. I really appreciate it. And thank I wish you. you luck with that approach with the transcranial. Um, thank I you. I hope that really works for you. It could take months to, to actually get right. up to the top of the list. So who knows? Oh, right. To get in there. Yeah. 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 Long way. Thank to you. Go. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, 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 Joanne, you have Daniel's email. So feel free to reach out to him. Right. As you journey, I will. As you are, as you, you know, go forward on this journey, uh, since you resonated so much with his presentation. I really do. Yeah, and I just want to say that as like as like an empathic counselor, when I'm doing brain health, I'm bringing the science in, but I'm doing it in a very intuitive way where I'm like in the moment, I'm tuning into the person that's before me. I'm not like just imposing a bunch of science. I'm like. Okay, what's this person presenting to me to the extent that I can tune into your subjective inner world and then bring in the science as it's needed? Oh, let's do this breathing technique here because I think that will help you. That's the way I operate. So although I have a brain health consultations and empathic counseling, I kind of blend them naturally as as needed in, in the session. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, and that's really the future, right? Is to integrate um, the intellectual with the intuitive. Um, is to be able to the highest of all knowing you know is within us and we can bring in science to help us understand and to help us navigate but the, the highest of all knowing is comes from within 
because there's no science or computer that has any higher frequency or consciousness um, than our soul, right? Mm -hmm. um, so when we when we start to um, integrate the two within ourselves and through coaching, like with someone like Daniel, who is really a master um, at both, right? Which is which is um, the time is now for that type of integration. So always keep that in mind, you know, I, that we know we have our own knowing within us and then we can help to understand that knowing um, through information such as through science or mm -hmm. um, other means. But um, anybody else have any questions or comments? Want to discuss anything with Daniel today? Jessica? Hey, Jessica. Just I think you're yeah, unmute. I'm trying to find the unmute button at the bottom. <laughs> it's on. Should be on the lower left of your screen. Oh, got it. Got it. Sorry okay. about that. No worries. Hi. Thanks for your presentation. It was really informative. Just wondering um, if you have any experience with plant medicines and how they affect the brain, CBD, psilocybin, things like that. I've got I've got a, a network of healer friends that are more specialized in that. In fact, I've I've uh, I think plant medicines are amazing. Um, I think mushrooms are probably very helpful. I've got literally a colleague of mine, a friend who's got a background in homeopathy, has started to explore that. So I think that's a promising area. I haven't myself personally explored those areas, but I tend to only want to talk about if I've used it. So there's the theory of it, and then there's the personal experience. So to give you an example, E3 Live is something I, I recommend to people because it's like it's like an off the charts version of spiritual spirulina, and it's very easy to digest. And I started playing with that and found some, some extraordinary benefits from that. So I'm just curious, from your point of view, have you yourself played with plant medicines? When you say yes. you're talking herbs and you're talking psilocybins, and what have you done? I'm just curious. Yeah, uh, so my background is that I'm a practitioner of traditional Chinese medicine. So okay. I utilize herbology there extensively. And over the past few years, I've run a medical cannabis clinic and I work with CBD. I use it personally and I've moved to a farm to grow CBD. Uh, so uh, CBD, I'm very familiar with. Uh, I use it myself. Um, and then psilocybin, I've been getting into over the last few years. Uh, and have been giving it to my patients uh, and for issues such as depression, pain, anxiety, uh, microdose specifically is, I see it changing people's lives. And then also psilocybin on a, uh, a larger dosage also is doing great things for people in terms of pain, uh, headache, things like that. That's amazing. Yeah, I yes. think the microdosing is important to kind of scale up uh, carefully and slowly and understand the effects. And as we were just talking about doing that, running that experiment with yourself. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah. Go ahead. I, I think that for somebody who's interested in using uh, psilocybin mushrooms, that microdosing is the perfect entrance way. Uh -huh. If yeah. if you want to do larger doses, it's a great way to get just used to how it affects you and how it makes you feel. Yeah, and there's all there's different there's different varieties of the mushrooms. And uh, a friend of mine literally just was just to give you uh, this is not myself, but my friend was like overjoyed. He finally found a solution because uh, he was recommended a couple of different types of uh, mushroom species for what he was dealing with. And now he's doing this experiment on himself. He's microdosing very carefully, and he'll go out and then he'll. Uh, sort of journal his experiences and it's actually allowed him to go into deep healing spaces with mm -hmm. his childhood and he's been doing homeopathy he's been doing going to healers he's tried everything and he was feeling hopeless mm -hmm. and he came across this approach and he started very slowly with the microdosing he had some advice to the the people that were it's a store in ottawa on bank street where he was mm -hmm. there's a couple different places um, but, um, I was feeling really uplifted for him and happy because he's like oh, overjoyed. Like, I think I found my thing. 
because it's not like the fix itself, but it's allowing him to uh, access deeper memories mm -hmm. that were hidden from him. So mm -hmm. that so so the the quick answer to your question is like yes, I endorse plant medicines. That's not my area, but there mm -hmm. are people that focus mm -hmm. like yourself and others um, that there's just a whole rich world, right, of Chinese yeah. herbology and uh, everything mm -hmm. else that you mentioned. So. I think the sky's the limit for what we can do in the healing realm because we're going like kind of now beyond the brain. There's, the brain is part of this larger system that we've been addressing. So, mm -hmm. um, so what's your background again? You you have a couple of different areas of expertise. Chinese you... medicine, uh, okay. farmer, hemp farmer, and I am very familiar with things that that you talked about, like the heart math and right. horses. Um, well, I have have horses and I'm probably oh. going to get into healing with horses at, at, at one point too. Um, but oh. just to speak on the different kinds of the mushrooms, like you were talking mm -hmm. about, I, I have about five different varieties. Oh. And I can say that uh, people report totally different experiences on the different kinds of mushrooms. It, it's, it's, it's very real. Yeah, I, that feels good to me because I you mentioned cannabis, but there's a I don't know what your feeling is about this, but I think there's could, there can be a shadow side to marijuana and the way it's being discussed. Hundred percent. Is that true? Like people can actually hundred percent versus doing yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, for cool. sure. Yeah, Definitely. and mushrooms seem like possibly a very safe, potent avenue if it's done properly with the microdosing. Mm -hmm. You have an expert like try this one, play with this. So. Yeah, from yeah. what I've heard so far, I feel very optimistic about it. Um, yeah, and there, there's a, a neuroplasticity neuroplasticity element to the psilocybin as well. Nice. Um, where there's um, an organization called MAPS. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, they're doing great work. Um, actually, the uh, main guy with uh, who runs MAPS, he's been running it for decades, and it's just really getting its popularity now and funding and it's it's about to really blow up in a big way um, but he was just on a did a joe rogan interview last week um, but they're doing oh. a lot of research in terms of uh like pretty high level uh scientific research on on how all different psychedelics affect the brain but they do work on mushrooms uh, a lot and there's a huge neuroplasticity element to the That's mushrooms awesome. i love yeah. that thank you yeah i'll go check it um, out and yeah uh, there's a Rogan, so it's a Joe Rogan interview. Do you remember the name of the guest? I could look it up real quickly here, if you just give me a sec. Can I ask you, Jessica, where you're located? I am about 15 minutes outside of the town of Port Perry. Oh, and have you got contact information? I For got sure. me. Clearly Lydia, you do. <laughs> Lydia has all my stuff. Okay. Do you mind, Jessica, when you're done that, to put it in the contact? Uh, sure. Sorry, in the um, chat. Sorry, your contact. In okay, the for sure. So this Joe Rogan episode, 1964, Rick Doblin. Okay. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. And then maybe yeah. also, Jessica and Daniel, if you want to just verbally state your contact information when we air this on the podcast. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. So I can be reached. Well, I'm on Facebook under Jessica Ray, R-E-A. That's probably a great, great way to get in touch with me. But you can send me a text at any time. And my phone number is 416-706-1795. Probably the best ways to get a hold of me. Thank you, Jessica. And Daniel, do you want yeah. to Can I ask one more question? It just okay. wants to it's a quick one. Yeah, the movie have... the movie dosed is out okay have you seen dosed no okay it's it's using iboga and mushrooms and oh it's... ibogaine yeah yeah so, so rick doblin on the joe rogan podcast he, he talks extensively about ibogaine yeah cool perfect thanks jessica yeah 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 that hey, sounds man. like a great thanks, source man. And Daniel, your contact information. <laughs> so I'll just tell the contact. I'll so say it out with email would be DG, oh, my last okay. name, M-A-U-R-O at protonmail.com. So I'll just leave my email. That. That's the best way to reach me. Can you repeat that? <laughs> yeah. DG, M-A-U-R-O at protonmail.com p-r-o-t-o-n mail.com great thank you thank you jessica and daniel i'm so i'm so glad you guys connected 
Mm. And um, maybe you guys will collaborate at some point. Um, yeah, so I'm very interested in this area. It's like it's a whole, it's like very complex and it's a burgeoning field. It feels to me like like musical medicine started to, you know, be a big deal a few decades ago, reactivating the ancient wisdom. This feels like another one of those areas where this like ancient wisdom is coming through and it's, we have all this wealth of uh, sources to help us heal. And I'm glad for people like you, Jessica. Lydia and Thanks. everybody else who's on here doing your great work. So it's been a pleasure. Wonderful. Anybody else want to share? Martin, you have a question. And Joanne, we're just going to mute. I'm going to mute while other people are speaking for background noise. Uh, I'm going to mute. Okay. Uh, Martin? Hi. Uh, yeah, I got an observational question. So sure. it's not me. Uh, it's not for me. The question's not for me. Um, it was actually an interesting conversation I had with uh, someone who's, um, let's see, I think he would be um, uh, 70, 70 years old, roughly. Mm -hmm. And um, he's he's having trouble sleeping. He has a sort of, you know, senior with ADHD. Um, and uh, he's trying to get off coffee reduces coffee, he's taking decaf. I said, there's still coffee, there's caffeine in the decaf still. He said, mm -hmm. no, no, it's decaf coffee. No, no, no. <laughs> anyway, uh, so he's having trouble sleeping. And he's always had, he said he's always had this issue and I'm not able to give him advice. Mm -hmm. You know, I kind of look at the whole picture like you guys. Mm -hmm. You know, the diet, the exercise, you know. Uh, the funny thing is, he cannot, he's married to a yoga a yoga teacher. Oh. He does not do yoga. He does not do meditation. He does not eat well. He's drinking coffee. And he's, he's wondering why he can't sleep. <laughs> it's like, a, it's like he's doing everything. Uh, from my perspective, he's doing everything wrong, and then he wonders why he can't sleep at night. Like he wakes up at six a.m. every day. Like for me, that's just I need another two hours, buddy. Like an hour and a half more than you do. But it's it's like yeah, it's like um, it's like you're doing everything against your your system. You know, uh, mind, body, spirit. You know, all all the organs and everything are they're working over time. You know, we have a big, he had a big steak, and then he, you know, how did he sleep? Because he's trying to digest all that that meat uh, and coffee and watching CNN and stuff. And it's it's just from your perspective. It's it's everything he's doing wrong, and then he's wondering why. And he, he took a, he said he took a, a gummy and he said he slept really well. And then uh -huh. the, the price of it went through the roof and he said, I can't afford this. That's <laughs> funny. So, That's yeah, I guess it comes down to personal responsibility. And from what you're indicating, he's got a wealth of hints and clues about things he could do, right? His environment, including his partner. But, you know, just basic things that we've already we've already kind of addressed the basics, which is, you know, exercise, mindfulness, diet is the sky is the limit. Right. So I think if you, I don't know if gummy bears would be my my primary uh, uh, brain health or sleeping therapy. But, you know, sometimes psychologically things can work for us because of the placebo effect, which Joe Spenza talks about the nocebo and the placebo. But, yeah, I think personal responsibility is a big deal. And I think. Part of it is our reliance, or maybe it could be with older generations too, on doctors and you know the pharmaceutical. I'm not bad mouthing this. I'm just saying there's other approaches that we know about, but especially everybody here in this this uh, group, because you're all obviously open to like innovative things, right? Epigenetics and neuroplasticity and psilocybins and mushrooms and you know cannabis and all sorts of cool realities. But at a basic level, there's simple things that he could obviously do if he sat down and talked to someone and really seriously wanted to shift it. I'm sure he could shift it in a matter of a week if he just shift a, a few key practices from what you're telling me, 
without knowing all the background context. I think there's. I think, I, I think part is certain. I think part of what Martin is describing um, with this gentleman is our is our personal journey. You know, mm -hmm. so we have to be ready. So yeah. we, we can spiral. You know, I used to say that my journey towards my acrobatics, I spiraled towards the center of it when I was ready. You know, I heard about it and then I played around with it and then uh, I, you know, read and then you know I did this and that and then finally I was ready. Right. And I committed right. and I went to Boston and I went to see Michikushi. So sometimes we just start to gather things in our world that we know are good for us, but we're not ready to implement them. And we can't force that. You know, mm -hmm. a practitioner, a coach, a spouse, a friend. We just hold that sacred space for them and then let them have that. Oh, obviously, we let them, but, you know, support them in their journey of self-discovery. But it's a great it's a great sign when somebody has in their world all of these positive things that they're not yet ready to implement. <laughs> right mm -hmm. <laughs> because they're spiraling towards their center of power right um in their own time and in their own way so this is very common this is very we all go through that i mean we all experience that it, whether it's health whether it's something else i mean we're on the planet uh, to learn yeah um and integrate uh who we are and what we can bring in to support ourselves and now on the planet there's so much right there's so much we have so much access it's not like when i was 10 and we had a black and white tv with two or three channels and a um what, what, what was it called a um a community phone what was it called those phones those phones where a uh, party line <laughs> a party line <laughs> or you could pick up the phone there could be your neighbor talking you know and then out of respect you would put the phone down so we have access to all this information um and it could be like wow yeah I love that and I love that and I want to do that but we're not we're we're slowly getting ready so that's 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 my interpretation of what's happening, especially if someone has a significant other who's very involved, right, in what where they want to go, but they're not doing it, like watching doing the yoga, right? Um, that sort of. <laughs> Martin, go ahead. Yeah, uh, actually, I know a younger friend of mine. I've known her for oh, I can't remember how many years, but. She's a, a really driven, high energy, healthy person. And somehow she's able to do meditation, which, which really confounded me, confused me. Well, I was really amazed that she was able to do it. So like you were saying, Daniel, like, you, you know, your brain can go really, really fast. And then you're able to say, okay, mind, body, spirit, let's just calm down, let's do meditation. And I was like, for me, that is like, that's fantastic, right? And this is maybe so something that I was saying to think, saying to Joanne, have you tried meditating and walking, meditating? Uh, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> That's, yeah. that's great martin and thank you for your comment too lydia and uh i couldn't agree more like i think when the when the student is ready the teacher appears so this whole concept of readiness so we're not for me i'm a big believer in personal freedom and so there's so many different uh let's say choices out there right now with the pandemic we'll call it choices and people are gravitating to what resonates with them and we really can't push someone towards a direction that we think is better for them if they're not ready to do it and so like this your friend it may be like he's got it around him but he ain't ready yet as Lydia pointed out but he might be just needing uh might be a timing thing and then something pushes him triggers him to like oh it's it's been all around me and now I just have to do this and then he's motivated by some cue it could be talking to you or seeing something on a YouTube video you know but yeah it's like sometimes our family and people closest to us they've got solutions right in front of us you know and it's the personal freedom thing is is very difficult i think it's it's masterful 
it takes mas mastery when we can just sit and be with someone and not want to impose or fix even if we got this whole plethora of genius level healing tools and knowledge we got to go what does this person need otherwise i'm 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 compromising their personal reality by like oh i have the solution for you just do this and that so so personal freedom for humanity as a species evolving this is a very important thing and i think it dovetails into what you said lydia and um thanks for your comment martin and uh, it's good that you're there as a, a friend to this person joanne yeah i just wanted to say to martin um i've done many different modes of healing and I've always been very active, you know, the swimmer, the runner, the walker, nature. And then I fell, Lydia remembers, I fell and broke my shoulder three years ago. So my struggle has been trying to get on a path, a healing path, because uh, they didn't do surgery. And and so it's been, an, it's been a lot of uh, what do you call it, domino effects with me. So I haven't been able to get back to swimming. I can't pull my bathing suit up, you know. I'm I'm trying to find, a, get back into the healing, whatever works for me. So it's been kind of a difficult three years with the pandemic. So, yeah, it's crazy. That's it. Well, congratulations, Joanne. I mean, I just from knowing you, I mean, you do the photon lights, you do red light, you do all lots of you know, yeah. and you're very committed to your personal growth, uh, to creating your highest yeah. and best life, and you yeah. will continue to do so. We go through these difficult times, and then we um, we get to the other side stronger for it, right? So, well, I'm determined. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. And that's you. that you will, it'll all come together. And, um, you know, just have, hold that inner knowing that the shoulder and everything right. associated with that is resolved. Thank you. Yeah, you can do it and you're not giving up and you're, and you're tenacious and you're resilient and you've tried a lot of things and just keep going because that as I mentioned with my friend, he was ready to give up and he had tried a dozen things and he's a very sensitive healer guy with lots of knowledge and he found for him, the mushrooms were the key. And so it's like, you find your thing that works for you and you're like, boom, you keep going. So the transcranial, who knows? Like you've tried a lot of stuff, but you're you're tenacious as Lydia said. And that's that's part of our path. That's part of our journey. That's why we're here as humanity to like learn and grow and develop our souls and, and uh, do our own like healing experiment we can call it you know what's right for us it's like it's such a variation of possibilities so uh, i second that congrats to you and good luck with that with what you're doing moving forward